All right. My watch reads one o'clock, so I'll welcome everybody. Thank you, everybody, so much for joining us. I don't know where you are, but it's a beautiful Sunday, Sunday, Sunday afternoon. Um, we've got some light clouds and flurries where I am at, but uh, thank you so much for participating and breaking, a, um, taking a break from your Sunday afternoon in order to join us for this. Um, and we're hoping, I want this to be somewhat of an open discussion, depending on how many people are here. I want this to be a way where we can kind of do some experience sharing about our relationship with En-ROADS, how we've used this powerful tool uh, for our presentations, both in regards to climate change in general and also towards carbon fee and dividend or the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. I know I've had a tremendous luck using this um, to a great degree in uh, presentations and looking for endorsements and also in just simple um, fact sharing or uh, is, you know, it provides, I, the story I always tell is before En-ROADS was around when I was looking for endorsements as the grass tops coordinator for my little chapter was, uh, you have to build this trust relationship that you knew what you were talking about and people believed you and that you, you know, could quote enough scientific journals and um, literature. And with En-ROADS, it provides two things. One, it provides a celebrated third party uh, analysis in real time so that you can actually say that this is brought to you by this, this, this the Sloan School from MIT and their in, Climate Interactive, their nonprofit arm dedicated towards climate. But it also provides such a visual response. I, I'm not sure if other folks who have had experience with this can attest to this as well, but just the fact that you can see in real time what this uh, model shows for comparing different policies on a global level, what that means for uh, in, a, in a visual context is tremendously effective. Really brings home the point for folks who, who need something visual like that. Um, and I, and I, I feel like that's a huge benefit in itself. So I'm gonna jump through the way I wanna organize this. It's We only have 90 minutes together, but I wanna organize it this way. One, talk to you about how I use En-ROADS as a setup within the presentations and then We'll step you through a bit of the, you know, this is how my presentations go, usually as a default, if I have enough time. And then, uh, and you know, I change them all the time, depending on the audience, and I'll go through that as, as we talk. And then dig into the En-ROADS model quite a bit, and then use that as a way of talking about how En-ROADS shows the, the two major takeaways of En-ROADS is there's no silver bullet, as they say in the, the En-ROADS training, we're, we're past that point with carbon uh, emissions so that we, we need more than one policy. But it shows on a global level that nothing does quite as much as carbon pricing, at least as it's portrayed in the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. So um, I'll hold off and intermittently, I'll ask for your, your questions and uh, or sort of comments and, or to unmute, or you can write them in the chat and we can get to you. So I know that there's also, I could also say before we get started, there are varying degrees of familiarity with En-ROADS. I'm gonna assume very little familiarity. Um, for those of you who are very familiar with it, please you know, be patient because we will be able to jump into this, but I, I'm really glad you are on the call because I want you to also to be able to uh, help me and um, and expressing how powerful a tool this is, but also sharing some of your unique experiences using this tool in presentations. So, um, I thinking about Catherine Hayhoe's call, uh, I always am amazed and um, empowered by in, in, uh, by her um, talks. And you know, she always talks about making sure that this is seen on our individual world, you know, the slice of the world we live in. So um, before getting into the inroads thing, I always like to talk about if I have the time, why climate change was personally, uh, hit me, my family, my little slice of the world. So being from Maine, where you have a celebrated seafood industry, um, when uh, my wife's mother was, is her birthday is January 1st, which is deep in the middle of, um, of what was Maine shrimp season. You could buy Maine shrimp shelled, which would be a certain amount of money, or you could buy it half cost with the shells still on it. And then we'd have this kind of Norman Rockwell kind of image of uh, families getting together and shelling um, shrimp together. And, it, and then when my daughter was born, it was like three generations of that family shelling shrimp. 
which was wonderful. I mean, a Norman Rockwell painting, except it was, it, you know, of course, you don't smell the same things that happens when you're smelling shrimp being peeled. But so I'd also I'd tell that story, and you know, that's means not a, a, a it means a state where um, we struggle with with rural poverty, and uh, that sh that shrimp industry at its peak in the late 1990s, a little more than 30 years ago, was a 13 and a half million dollar industry. Industry, which is a big deal for uh, an industry or for, for a little state like Maine. I mean, that's gone. The shrimp harvestry has been closed for the past six or seven years now. Um, and, you know, we have to think about, you could draw comparisons. It doesn't take too much imagination to realize how many millennia those shrimp have been in the Gulf of Maine, how long um, and how, you know, for millennia and, and, and here it is, just this little amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has has made main waters warm faster than almost any other part of the world. And you can't, you can only put, you know, connect the dots to realize that how much more years are we going to have of main shrimp, um, winter recreations, ice fishing derbies, you could name it, you know. Um, I, what I like to point out to this, you know, this is just a an image. Uh, this is not my mother-in-law peeling shrimp, just for the for the record. Um, but anyways, so you know, I could talk about all of the other things Maine has to lose: Maine, uh, winter recreation, and you could do this for for your own states. Uh, you know, it doesn't take too much imagination for this to go. And this this works for people's heartstrings, but also works for their. If you're appealing to the chambers of commerce, all the businesses that are going to go away, um, coastlines. People don't think about coastlines, but you know, beaches take millennia to develop, to evolve, develop as uh, slow erosion happens. But if we're talking about the almost instantaneous sea level rise we're talking about geologically speaking that happens for um, in this in this man-made climate change, um, we're not going to be seeing, seeing beaches. Um, a lot of this uh, the data that I have at the beginning is take poached right off of the um, the stuff that En-ROADS provides for its presenters. So En-ROADS, if you don't know, has an eight eight week training course that you can either watch videos as they are canned on their website or to watch them live and, and be able to respond with the instructors. They're fascinating. Um, they are fascinating and also they don't um, they don't uh, prevent themselves from deep digging deep into the statistics and the the complex systems that are involved. It's over 1600. Uh, oh no. Are you still there? I can okay, see. Sorry, yeah. I just had a I just had a blip of power, and I didn't I didn't know what happened just there. Okay, sorry about that. I had a scare as if something happened like yesterday. Anyways, we all don't need to see this, but we've because we've seen all of many of these things before. But I'd post a lot of these for the folks who do need convincing that there's a robust scientific relationship between increasing levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and um, the and uh, climate change they are here for you. And I won't, I'm not gonna be, belabor these by going over these again and where they're contributing from. They have these beautiful pictorial uh, representations that I, I, when I have the time, um, and if it's an audience I'm approaching that needs some convincing about climate change, I'll talk about you know, how this will affect us. They've done, uh, they've borrowed these coastal analyses of what they might do. They've even done this nice image of showing you um, what Wall Street will look like with four degree warming by the end of the century. Um, okay, but I wanna jump right into the model itself because it's such a powerful model and open up the conversation. So I am going to switch over now to, so as you open up En-ROADS, it'll look like this. Um, and as you can see here, for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the, the default settings and it's continually updated. But En-ROADS, as I said before, is a product of MIT's Sloan School of Management and their nonprofit arm, Climate Interactive. Uh, they have uh, been working on developing tools like this for a while. Uh, the previous tool that I like to talk about is C-ROADS, which is also on available. It's not quite as um, versatile and as policy driven, but C-ROADS is basically a model that was used uh, about five in the 2015 Paris Protocol negotiations from those on the ground, and we actually had somebody in our in our main chapter who was involved in the IPCC 
was saying that it was pivotal for negotiations of levels of carbon dioxide that different regions of the world had to stay with. So as we, um, that, that tool was, was uh, for that, but we're getting more involved into the policy. And this is constantly updated by the latest data from the IPCC and the scientific community on climate change. And the default settings are here, which shows kind of a, um, per, a different uh, sectors contributions to our energy on the left. And we have coal is black, red is oil, blue is natural gas, green is renewables, pink is bioenergy, light blue is nuclear, and new zero, which is uh, you know, in, which is zero, which is zero now, but we needed a catch-all um, category for in case we created uh, cold fusion or something else that we we can't anticipate in 2020 that might come down the path. Um, we can move any of these, and this is, doesn't mean that we're necessarily changing the actual uh, increase or in, increase use or decrease use of coal, oil, natural gas, bioenergy, all these things, but incentivizing it through market forces. We can do that kind of as a rough estimate by grabbing these black dots, or we can hit these three dots and see kind of a, a more detailed dive into what's happening. So in renewables, I just clicked on those three dots. If you didn't see what I just did here, we can look at projections of what's happening here. So I can see, um, you know, renewables uh, tax subsidies, when the, this year they start, when there's a big research and development breakthrough, when that breakthrough year might happen, storage, which basically means battery technology, when that breakthrough might be, we can get more involved in that. And any questions that you might have, and I referred to these in more than one presentation to see exactly how they're, they're looking at things by going through this and seeing where they're getting um, their information. And a lot of this is coming from basically it's saying, we are looking right now at business as usual, which is the status quo. Um, and if we, and when we can move these toggle, these in different variations, uh, either increasing the, the tax subsidy or decreasing, that's all through what economists and scientists think is likely on each of these. So each one of these has these three doggles, um, energy efficiency, of course, in transportation and electrification. We hear a lot about that, more of that in a minute. Um, building an industry, efficiency and energy and electrification, and then growth in both population and economic growth. Uh, as much as we can control that will also be um, managed here. Land management, either through the rate at which we're cutting down the world's forests and deforestation or methane and other uh, gases, which comes from agricultural or um, uses or from leaks in um, natural gas pipeline, natural gas lines, um, and then carbon removal, either through natural means by afforestation, meaning planting trees. Remember the uh, one trillion tree plan that we were hearing about, I guess, last summer. Um, that would be in this category, or in technological, uh, which is this one's a big catch-all, but it could basically mean anything from we're talking a direct air capture. Uh, or which is basically a machine that will grab carbon out of the atmosphere, or um, bioenergy capture, um, capture and storage. And that's basically using uh, lichens or blue-green algae, that kind of thing that might be able to do that. Um, mineralization, uh, soil sequestration, which is actually big with, uh, that came up big time in one of our lobbying meetings, and we went right to En-ROADS with that, which was a big coup for us because it was proved uh, useful. And then biochar, which is another agricultural thing that's that's been used. So, anyways, all of these things can be um, can be toggled in either a rough estimate or a uh, a more detailed estimate. I should say that when I use this model, and I'm not sure if other people have. Um, well, before I say that, I should say that there these are just I I don't have time uh, in my presentations or here to really go through all of the different things that this tool can use. You can see all of these different things are things we can look at. Cost of energy, that comes up from time to time. Cost of energy by sector, um, sea level rise, uh, and uh, global emissions and removals by, uh, by sector as well. Those kinds of things. I actually, what I like to default, and I can change any of these, um, this I actually default back to how this graph originally, when it was first released a year ago, En-ROADS used to default to temperature change. 
And I think everybody on the call is probably most worried about that. Um, so that's kind of like the, the big driver that and I leave that up there when I'm showing this. And I also usually when global temperature increases, uh, sorry, instead of having global source as a chart like that, I tend to like it as this, which is not compiling it all together, but we can see it's a, a little bit easier to see the differences going up and down of each one of these um, energy use. So at this point, before we start modeling things, I might ask if anybody has questions about the orientation. Um, one other thing I should say, whoops, I should also say, if people have questions and push back on your assumptions, which happens from times to time, one of the strongest points about this model is that the assumptions are malleable. I can actually, it, it defaults to the latest thinking by the IPCC and the scientific community, but I can actually move assumptions around so that if I'm down here, I can say, for instance, perhaps the climate system is not as sensitive as I, as the scientists say. So for instance, let's, pers let's say that, um, you know, uh, the methane's emissions from biological activity, let's, let's say that that's not as, as uh, it, to the level that we thought, or perhaps it's worse, or perhaps that the, the, the sensitivity of the permafrost is different, or there's some threshold that might, that might be different than what scientific communities is. We don't move these around too much, but I, I also, you know, and there's vast, there are lots of options about this. One that comes up often, and you know, there's, you're having to do a little bit of guesswork with any kind of prognostication, but progress ratio, which is a great one to play with, which basically means the rate at which new investment in um, innovation and research and development will change the price of that. So for instance, renewables, I could say like, well, let's say that they're actually gonna get cheaper faster um, and that it's, uh, so I could move that in, in a direction and see, but it, you will see that it actually changes. Um, if this is a negative effect, we could see this, it does change that in a minor effect. Um, but it, it we, uh, I will, so let me break it down from there, but does anyone have any questions about first orienting themselves to the model first, but before I start jumping into looking at different scenarios and policy choices? Hey, Peter. Hey, Peter. We have a great question from Tom. Uh, I'm getting an echo. Are you folks getting an echo? I'm not. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, we have a great question from Tom Wilson from Vermont. Um, Tom says, I'm always hesitant in using modeling tools like this, especially when it is projecting to an unknown future. Can you address the sources, assumptions, and verifications behind the predictions? Saying it came from MIT helps, but as a retired building scientist where fancy computer algorithms with lots of bells and whistles, but without backup assumptions don't necessarily convince me. Yeah, and, and you're right. I think I think that's also, it's always very important to be very clear when using this, and, and, I, and I do this is to say that this is just a model. It's, and it's, it helps that it's updated with, with resources, and we've seen it since it was released a year ago, updated to better reflect some of the scientific uh, change in thinking that's happened in just in the past year. Um, and I can talk about that in, in, in if you're interested, but um, it actually, the projections when it first was released in December of 19, we were looking at a status quo of getting us up to 4.1 degrees above, uh, above pre-industrial levels C, and now it's 3.6. So it's a step in the right direction. And there's, a, there's basically three different reasons why one is because how we define pre-industrial um, changed a bit, which is um, that's a disappointing reason, or it's not it's not like we're doing it. But then another reason is because the costs, the progress ratio in solar is coming down so fast. But to get back to your greater point, I think it's really important to be very clear about this as a model, and um, as I use it mostly as a persuasive tool. There's another shortcoming of this model. It's also that you have to be very upfront about is that this is a global model. So for, for us in Maine and New England and Northeast in general, we're blessed with a fairly uh, green or renewable rich energy grid, which is not the case if you're in other parts of the country. Um, so if we do things like changing the electrification of transportation, we have to think about this in terms of the entire globe going in that direction and not necessarily what happens in my backyard or my neighborhood or my state or my region. Um, but I think Tom, you're right about that. I think that the, um, you know, it's, 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 I think you're, it's important to make sure that you're, you're very upfront about that. The further out we go, the less we can be sure about these things, the, the larger the, 
um, the, the variance may be. However, there are numbers of reasons to look, and actually, let me jump over to say this. There's a number of reasons to be um, uh, confident in this model, and I, I'm upfront about this in my, in my presentations, where I talk about, one, it's peer-reviewed. Uh, when this model was released, uh, it was actually the first time I saw it was in June of 19. It was took a, a more than half a year of a rigorous, robust gauntlet of peer review before they kind of came back and it was a little less, it was a little more conservative in some of its estimates, um, which actually was disappointing, I think, to some of the CCL folks, because at first uh, carbon fee dividend did even better than it does now. But um, but I, that's one point. Um, robustness to extreme con conditions. I've heard of people who have shown this model to uh, some someone with a scientific background. They said, this model is intriguing. I want you to take everything and move it in the bad direction and see what happens, or move it all in the good direction and see what happens, just to see what happens when we put it through extreme conditions. Um, and thankfully, it holds up. Um, it's an, uh, the comparisons of behavior to measured in historical data. We can actually backtrack the algorithms that have created this to, you know, and the interactions to go back and see how it related if we were to stop and prognosticate from like 1992 now it actually jibes with historical data pretty well. Um, comparisons of the behavior with, uh, of, the of other models future project projections, which is basically saying, how does this compare with, um, with other, mo other models that are out there that are, are less uh, user-friendly? User um, and then comparison to the experts mental models, which just basically, does this make sense when we get climate experts like Catherine Hayhoe or, um, you know, or whoever it might be to look at this. And then finally, policymakers. Does this model actually um, make sense in terms of the policy end of things, which is sometimes the the gap that the scientific community doesn't bring, which, uh, you know, that, that they don't address because they're, they need to stay within the ivory tower of thinking of this entirely scientifically. This model is resilient to the policy choices that are put forward. So um, I hope that makes, uh, make some sense, but you're right. We have to be very upfront about this. this is just a model. So Peter, we have a question from, <laughs> from Nancy Jacobson from New York um, that she just wanted to bring up the point that En-ROADS has done um, verification studies comparing it with the big disaggregated models. Uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I, um, I'm no expert on on that, and in fact, you know, if she can speak to it, she she might be able to to help me out with that. But there are the I actually can um, I don't have it in, in the my my slideshow for today, but you can actually go back and see some. Um, and, I, and if you're curious, I can actually send you some of those slides, which just basically shows future projections where En-ROADS would be on renewables and other different components, and talking about how that basically they're they're tracking more or less the conservative middle of those future projections. Um, and those aggregate models, they, 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 they kind of seem to be coalescing around the same thing. And I, I can't give you a visualization of that um, right now, but, they, I, but if, if, she, if she wants, I could follow up if, if she puts her name in the chat with, with some information about that. Great. We have uh, we have one. Uh, we have a couple other questions here. I don't know how much time you wanted to allocate for this. But... Yeah, it, it, sure. Okay. So one quick one from Leslie Cannot. Um, En-ROADS is a global model, and therefore uh, changes made by moving the sliders must be made on a global scale. But CCL focuses on U.S. policy, at least in the U.S. Have you used the energy policy solutions from Energy Innovation? Uh, they focus on U.S. issues, and is there other other? How do you contextualize this with uh, in your meetings? Yeah, that's a great question, and that's a, so that the, and I said briefly earlier that I I do the, the other thing besides the fact that this is just a model, and the big caveat of that is it's global. Um, one of the I actually use that as a jumping off point when I'm getting pushback about that to talk about two things. One, the United States is way behind on addressing its. Um, you can look at Climate Tracker, as Catherine Hayhoe sent us yesterday, and see how far behind we are. We're, we're you know, uh, criminally negligent in dealing with our carbon emissions. So we are the ones who are catching up on this. So if we're trying to track something, um, but I guess what I should say is I use it as a jumping off point to talk about carbon, uh, the carbon fee and dividends, um, the, the third leg of the stool, which, you know, first, the gradually increasing price on carbon, the second being the returning the dividends to everybody. 
and the third being the uh, uh, the um, border adjustment fee, basically saying to internationalize the policy. Now, not every policy can be done that way, and that's a shortcoming of the model. But it's a way that the model it's a it's a choice the the model makers had to make, I think, in order for it to be user friendly, or else it would be very complicated and difficult to deal with. I have not had experience with those other with those using other models in presentations, but because I'm kind of seeing this model. Uh, not almost, not exclusively, but fairly rigorously uh, in terms of as a proponent for carbon fee and dividend. I see this model as thinking like, well, as we get into small different things, and maybe we should do that right now, is to, to look at, say, what happens when we highly incentivize electrifying our vehicles, or what happens if we highly incentivize renewables or nuclear or planting a trillion trees or whatever that might be. We have to think on a global scale. So that's why there might be some surprising findings from the model. Um, and the nice thing about when I, what I usually try to use this, and, and this is the way I use En-ROADS to kind of help in my salesmanship as a, as an, uh, try, as a grass tops um, endorsement seeker, is to try to show the, uh, even though it doesn't do everything, it, uh, it is a, um, perhaps it's the, it, it's, it does the most to put a car price on carbon. It doesn't address the equitability issue of it. We don't talk about dividends using En-ROADS, but the carbon price does more than anything else. And that's surprising for a lot of people because it's not the sexy answer. It's not the windmill in your backyard or the solar panels on your roof and, um, and that sort of thing. So um, I'm not sure if I answered that question, but I hope so. But I, I feel like maybe I should just start jumping into things because the folks who have not, let me just do that because, and I, I keep the good questions coming. These are great. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about this. And per, you know, what I would do if it was a small group, and perhaps we should do this now, is just talk about like what people want to see. But I can tell you like off the back of my, you know, just from memory, what in my experience in presenting to community groups, faith organizations, business groups, Kiwanis and Lions Clubs and Rotarians, um, what they usually jump to. Um, and from our group, you know, we're hearing a lot of stuff about in Maine, about most of our emissions coming from our, or at least the, the largest component coming from our tailpipes. Big rural state, everyone drives everywhere. Why don't we just give everybody heavy incentives to buy a Nissan Leaf or buy a Prius? So what I say is, okay, well, let's do this. We can do a deep dive into this, but I think for the sake of argument, it's just easy to just grab this and move it over as a macro level, which means we're incentivizing electrification of our vehicles and transportation, which means more than just more than just cars, um, on a global scale. And you have to ask everybody, and it's imperative, I think, as or at least um, Climate Interactive wants you to say, what do you think will happen before you actually, uh, you know, before you actually move the slide or whatever. So. Imagine what you might, and this is a savvy group, so you're not going to be as surprised, but what might happen to global temperature changes and what might happen to where our energy is coming from when I grab this thing and move it all the way over. And now that you've imagined it, I will do so. And you can see, well, we have some good things happening. Uh, oil use went way down. Renewables went way up. These are both happy scenarios. Um, but sadly, you know, we're, we're looking here at temperature changes uh, and you can see the light blue line is the current scenario I'm, I'm looking at and the baseline, which is what we have without any policy change at all, basically what's happening today, continuing uh, uh, business as usual. We only have a, a tenth of a degree difference. And a lot of the secret of this, and this is the nice part of using En-ROADS is that they've got this, go this, you can switch back and forth to undo this policy and then redo this policy and see what's changing, especially the thing I'm asking you to look for on the left is the black line, the coal line. So as I move that over, you can see that coal actually increases. So you can talk about why that is a lot of the world, if we're actually just as a single policy and only that, talking about incentivizing electric vehicles, you have to think, where's that electricity coming from? And for a vast majority, a lot of the world, the developing world, um, it's coal. When a year ago, this month, when uh, Australia was having its bushfires, record bushfires, which we heard Catherine Hayho talk about yesterday, the number one export was still coal at that point. So you can imagine, you know, that's uh, to developing 
to China and the and Southeast Asia and other developing countries in China. So I also should say that I zero out each policy because the biggest impact, these are not necessarily additive, but the big biggest impact of any policy will be the first thing you do. So I'm zeroing it out to go back to my, my original scenario here. Uh, temperature, so so we're not looking at any policy. So that was electrification of vehicles. What happens if we look at something else? Like let's say uh, you have a Republican group who uh, perhaps or a conservative leaning group saying, I've read that article that says that planting a trillion trees may, may be the solution. Um, and of course we could grab that and move that over and you can imagine what that's going to do here and here. If I grab this and move it all the way over, of course, Nothing happens on this side uh, because we're not we're we're not actually addressing where en energy is coming from. But uh, temperature change has gone down again by a tenth of a degree, um, and that's uh, and we have to think about why is that because we're not addressing actually putting a thumb on the source of the carbon emissions as we know from CCL's work that is a kind of critical for us to be able to um, to get a handle on this and stabilize the climate. So I can go back from there. Um, I could also, what might else come in, and feel free to type in anybody who, or put into the chat what you might like to see, but I, I know a lot of folks would say, well, what happens if we have like really highly incentivize renewables? And we can do this. And both renewables and nuclear actually surprisingly have a similar um, prognosis, uh, uh, layout where if we ramp this up and highly incentivize this, again, I can do this in different ways. I can make it a breakthrough or I can, break it down differently if I click those three dots. But if I just grab this and move it all the way over, again, great stuff. We've got renewables going through the roof. Um, and in the short run, we have coal going down. And remember coal's the most plentiful, plentiful uh, fossil fuel on the planet. And we want that to go down because it's dirty, um, you know, and, and more so than, than oil and like twice as much, I, I believe, as, as natural gas. So when we see that renewables are going up uh, and oil going down, those are good news. However, there's a rebound effect. So you have to think about everything economically. And because this is a triumph of systems analysis, right? We talked about those 1,600 different equations that are that are working together to, to, to show in this model. You can see that it goes down in the, in the short term. And you can talk about the thought experiment of, OK, everyone's we've Government, governments have somehow made renewables cheaper, either through renewables or tax uh, tax credits or rebates or whatever it might be. As the price of renewables goes down, everyone switches away from coal and uh, other uh, fossil fuels, which is good. The price of coal, because it's so plentiful, will drop lowest and hit kind of rock bottom prices someplace in mid-century and then start its rebound climb. So even though we've incentivized renewables, coal will start picking back up again in market share because it has been adjusted to that those incentives for renewables and will start picking up again. So in other words, we need something that's both incentivizing the good stuff, renewables, uh, and disincentivizing the fossil fuels. Um, and as we know from our work in CCL, we know what that is. So I can act, let me just go through just for the sake of thoroughness and talk about uh, nuclear does something very similar. And see the blue line picks up and coal went down midterm. And it actually goes, goes down a little, like grow, overall it did go down, but it does pick up and it continues to grow through the end of the century, even with highly incentive subsidizing uh, nuclear. Um, we can talk also, I'm saving, and I do this in my, in my presentations as well, is saving carbon price. Usually, I don't know about you guys, but usually for me, it's... Um, it's not hard to save carbon pricing for the end because it's not something that comes up for people early on, if you know what I mean. It's people tend to think about this as uh, you know, they, that's the last thing they think about um, unless they've been exposed to kind of the, the CCL way of thinking or climate leadership council stuff. Um, but we can also talk about other things. We could talk about the electrification, I'm sorry, the uh, building an industry. This is actually, I found the second biggest bang for your buck. If I actually just move uh, the energy efficiency of building an industry. Again, I can do this and see uh, how this would work. Funny enough, I really like seeing this stat here, uh, which is the uh, energy intensity of gross domestic product. You can see that little blip there as it goes up. 
and you can think to yourself, well, why this is, you know, the first 20 years of this graph is historical. So what do you think is happening here? And you can write in the chat. What happened about 11, 12 years ago? Or unmute yourself. We have some folks saying in the chat, the recession. Yes, exactly, right, oh, good, that's great. Yeah, so the recession happened, right? So suddenly everything was topsy-turvy and it's hard to really, uh, well, you know, I'm sure there's economics uh, professors who will fight about exactly what the actual reasons were, but energy intensity just basically um, climbed because there was less of incentives to, because uh, car, uh, prices went down and folks were didn't have to incentivize their energy intensity as much, uh, reducing it as much. We can actually see more of that. Actually, I should. This is a sidebar, but if I go to these Kaya graphs over here, Kaya is, is someone's name. It's it's named after the the fellows. We actually can see that this is going. This is kind of the prime driver for where our CO two emissions, the primary source of our uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, where they're coming from. Global population as it climbs. You know, it's supposed to level off towards the end of the century, but it's, but after it kind of tickles with uh, 11, mil, uh, bill, uh, <laughs> 11 billion people, and um, we can see where GDP is climbing, climbing, climbing. We can also see that that dip right there in energy intensity again uh, in the 2008 uh, market correction. Um, carbon intensity of final energy with going down. That's good. But when we're talking about that plus the GDP going up, uh, then if you multiply these together, we get carbon emissions from energy increasing. So that's what we want to address. But let me let me go back then to uh, to our graphs. Hey Peter, we have a couple of suggestions from the crowd. Um, yes, please. Can you can you look at uh, proper soil management? Yes. Oh, I'm glad that came up. I, I meant to do that earlier. Yes. That was so. I mentioned that um, we came. That came up in one of our main um, CCL lobby meetings, which was great. But it was basically so. Again, this goes under it. It actually is kind of surprising when you think about this, but it's under technological carbon removal. Um, and I can click on this and do a deep dive into the the detail. So I'm using detailed settings here at this point. Um, so the so I talked before briefly about. Uh, bioenergy um, capture and storage, direct air capture, meaning like those Swiss engineers who are working on machines that are not market ready yet, because it's very expensive to pull carbon directly out of the atmosphere, but, uh, and then mineralization. And then what we're talking about, agricultural soil carbon sequestration, percentage of maximum potential. So what we're looking at here, and I can just grab this and say, we're gonna start this year and we're gonna move this up. Let's say, let's give it a good, healthy boost and see what that means of sequestering carbon. So you can see this bump, it actually breaks you down on these sub, uh, as everyone's seeing, this is related subgraph of the gigatons of CO2 removed in uh, per year. And this is not inconsequential, this is fantastic. So that by like the 20, late 2030s, we're like pushing up towards four gigatons of CO2 per year, which is awesome. Problem is, is we're still increasing the rate in which we're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere. So it's competing against, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a great component of what needs to happen. But that's why when we, we did this, you can see, oh, I still have my temperature chart. It, did, it had a very small difference there. But let's, let's just say for sake of argument, let's bump it all the way over and see, okay, Brett got us down a 10th there. Um, we could also do the same thing with biochar. And, you know, you can read up again on the distinction between biochar and all this stuff under this fact section. But um, but let's say we're going to maximize this potential and also do that and see if that's, I mean, as you can see now, we're doing great work with getting our, our soils to uh, sequester carbon in the atmosphere. However, again, because we're competing with rising CO2 emissions from oil and from coal and from natural gas, it's, it's, we, need to, we need to help it out in order for us to actually have it to maximize the potential. Um, does that help? Okay, so I'm, I can I'm do that and I will uh, redo that policy. Oops, pardon me. Because it's two policies, I can't do it just that way. 
Peter, uh, other about, other ideas? How about looking at uh, veganism or increased plant-based diets? Yes, very good. Okay, so these are all great. Okay, so we can look over here. A lot of where that's coming from, and you can read up on this is basically what the, what we're saving. And I'm just going to do this from what we're saving is basically plant-based diets means fewer livestock on the planet, which means less methane, which is the second uh, strongest driver of, of or contr contribution to greenhouse gases. So let's move this down someplace arbitrary and see what that does. That does quite a bit, does quite a bit. We can also see like where we were in terms of, um, you know, it talk about the co-benefits uh, co from this. It just means like a healthier lifestyle. There are, you know, that kind of thing. So these are all fascinating and you can talk about, you know, you can do deep dives into all these things. I learn every time I do this because there's more to look at. Um, but veganism and plant-based diets definitely do help. Um, I can also look at, you can see here, uh, we, so this is CO2 equivalent in methane. Um, we can also, if we wanted to, we could do a deeper dive and check this out and say, okay, how much of this is coming from agricultural waste? If we are tightening that up, our representative has actually co-sponsored a number of bills on that uh, just because of the amount of CO2 that's, uh, oops, let me do this first and bring that back to where it was, pardon me. Okay, and then we'll do the deeper dive and check this out. So yeah, so agricultural waste, we can do um, uh, internal emissions, which means other gases that are coming. So this is, whoops. Other gases that are that would be coming from not not methane, but other uh, environmentally uh, or greenhouse gases, which is basically uh, methane, um, nitrous oxide, and F gases. So we can check all those out. We can also move this in this direction and see if we combine those two. It does quite a bit. Sorry, other comments? How about uh, banning coal? Coal, I love it. So coal is a great one, but exactly. That's the one. So if we look on this end, we can look at uh, taxing coal or a subsidy, gosh forbid, for coal. Um, but I like this one, which is just basically, let's just say we're going to stop building new coal infrastructure. Again, I've zeroed this out. We're back to business as usual. People are still eating meat. People are still driving around gas cars. But if I do this, that does next to the EICDA, I believe this is the second biggest thing you could do is just have a worldwide pact to, to no longer use coal. And you can see just by having the coal structure, uh, the, that infrastructure of burning coal gone, then by the 20, you know, like the last coal plants are burning out in the 2060s. And Peter, uh, we just have a clarifying question from uh, from Tom Wilson from Vermont. Is the methane are the methane reductions just from agricultural measures, or does it also include well leakages that we were just talking about before? Yeah, it's it should be both. And I'm no I'm not fluent in the methane to that extent, but you can see. Let me let me see if I can see the answer to Tom's question. Um, oh, other greenhouse gases charge. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, it's it's mostly they're saying the primary thing is from agricultural, but they do say other you know industrial uses as well. So that's from, and you actually can chase methane. The other primary spot where methane can come from is from natural gas. We can tighten up uh, natural gas lines if we look under natural gas, and um, methane leak rate, leakage rate. I knew it was here. Thank you. So I could actually like that's the other spot where we can get it if that answers some partially Tom's question. At this point, let me do one thing because I wanna dig into some of the talking about, cause it's inevitably where, um, this is great for people to kind of talk and experiment and think about, again, we have to think about these things in terms of a global scale. But even with that caveat, I believe, and you tell me if you, if, if you think I'm wrong, that this is still a very persuasive model because it still shows the comparative effectiveness of all of these different policies. I mean, there'll be in intricacies about what's happening, you know, in what the way Canada, you know, 
banning, a, well, banning a coal plant will be a universal, but if we were to do highly electrifying our vehicles is in Canada or Quebec, which gets, you know, 95% of its uh, electricity from, from renewables versus um, the tornado belt of the United States or, you know, China or where it's, where it's a lot of its coal contributions. Um, those are very, very different outcomes. But just to see, you know, as a, as a back of the envelope comparison of policies, I feel like this is really persuasive. And I really don't tend to use this with folks beyond the, fo you know, I always kind of steer clear from actually going to, you know, taking these reductions in temperature increases to the bank because it's just a model one and because we're talking about a lot of different variables that are going on here. But um, at this point, I would like to do is talk about the two different carbon pricing bills or bills, uh, ideas that we've had. And I've actually used this amongst different groups in talking about this. And, and then I'll open up for more questions. But we can, um, I, we've compared this with the Baker Schultz plan. Let's, let's start with the Baker Schultz plan, actually. So that we could take a look at the carbon price of $40 per ton of CO2. And we're going to say that that starts um and you know we're going to say that it's within one year it's going to get to that level and that's you know we know that the eicda will exceed this within your you know the third or fourth year but um with the baker schultz plan we can see already significant carbon reductions down to 3.3 right from so that's three degrees i was like that's comparable i think with what we just saw for when we, we retired all the coal plants in the world um, so that's very encouraging. If we were to actually model, it's a little bit backwards how you have to model the EICDA in this, um, because we're going out to 2100, which is all anyone should be careful, you know, if dare to guess about. But if we were to do this, we're going to say that the initial price, of course, is $15 per ton of carbon. We're going to start in 2021, uh, and it's going to be, you know, one of the bragging rights of this that we were hearing from Danny Richter yesterday, yesterday was that it, you can implement this within nine months, so close enough to a year uh, to achieve that final carbon price. Uh, we know that it's going to take, well, because the model goes out 80 years to 2100, we're going to say it takes 80 years to achieve the final price, and we're going to have that in linear climb. It's going to start achieving that final carbon price in 2021, and the final carbon price is Correct me if my math is wrong, but I've done this a zillion times. It's 80, 80 years times 10 bucks a year. We're doing a conservative. I know that the bill states we can go up. If we don't hit certain earmarks, we are going to go up even faster. But it's going to go up 10 bucks per year for 80 years, plus the initial 15 bucks is 815 bucks on a ton of carbon, of CO2 rather. And we can see that that goes up linearly and again, does not to do everything we need to do. And we shouldn't think that we have, you know, I look forward to the day when Danny Richter tells us now that we've got the EICDA passed, what we're going to be working on next. But um, but this, even though there is no silver bullet, this does more than any other thing we've seen so far this afternoon. Um, and I challenge you, if you do find something that's like a single policy that gets us there. Um, so that's one thing that's nice. So remember that, you know, it's effective, we haven't talked about how it being equitable, but that's why the other part of my presentation is all about uh, fancy slides showing that how this benefits low and middle income and working class Americans most. Um, and we all know that, but the, um, from CCL stuff, but um, the most important tool for this is to show the uh, supreme effectiveness of the, and um, expediency of this, the fact that we can ramp this up and we can have that, you know, if that comes up, you can talk about how regulations and incentives for, uh, can take a long time to put into place. Whereas the, you know, we can parrot Danny Richter's talks about how um, an expedient climate policy would be carbon pricing because we can implement that within nine months and it's resilient to a Supreme Court that's uh, because the constitution is very clear about the fact that the legislative branch holds the purse strings. So um, with that, I want to leave us with a pretty picture because we I don't know about you, but I always stare at these dotted lines, which IPPC says, IPCC says we need to stay below. 1.5 degrees is frighteningly difficult to stay below. It is possible and we can all play with that. Um, and two degrees, since it looks like we'd be blowing past this, the, the thing I is, is also difficult, but it's possible. 
Now, one thing that I also see is to take out, look how long with a policy that starts in 2021 for our trajectory to, to, to deviate from business as usual. That's also something to keep in mind and is, a, is an important point to bring up to audiences, I feel, because we're talking about stuff that's gonna, you know, we need to do now, act now for things that are gonna be crucial for all the things we're worried about in the future. The other thing that's nice though, is that since this carbon price is, you know, oh, one thing I should say is, I get the question all the time that, why does it look like the carbon price is so low here? And it's because the de it's actually defaulting to whatever my initial carbon price is. That's where that $15 is. So it's considering that low. It's not in that macro level, that big slider, looking at where the far final carbon price is. So that's just a quirk of, of the model. But because carbon pricing is uh, uniquely, um, it can be imposed economy-wide, right? We now are, don't have to worry about playing whack-a-mole where we incentivize electric vehicles, everybody switches to get to electric vehicles and then the coal power plants go, go bananas because, you know, or coal, you know, we have something, we have some kind of unforeseen uh, leakage of carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions that we don't want to know about. Okay, the next thing I'd like to do here, I know we probably, oh, go ahead, David. I'm sorry, I'm talking too long. And we just have a couple of questions specifically about this, uh, understandably from CCLers in the crowd. So, um, could, first of all, could you could you share the share this carbon pricing scenario in the chat? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, yeah. That's so nice about this. So, actually, when I sometimes send out um, follow up talks to folks, you can actually send this. I can just grab that, and that data there is saving this scenario. So I can just do one of these things. Uh, where's my chat? I don't know. I'm not going to be able to. Can I? I don't know if I can chat without someone sharing my screen. I guess I'm not Zoom sophisticated enough as I, as that is. But oh, there it is. I can do it. Hold on. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put that in. Very good. Great. And then um, they. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Why is uh, nuclear output so low under the EICDA? That's a great question. I've never actually gotten that question before. I think it's because, I mean, nuclear stays low throughout the century because of there has been a gradual increasing and stronger and stronger uh, conservative regulations on nuclear because of some high profile um, nuclear accidents <laughs> in the past 40 years. Um, so that is probably why. I think a good reference for that is if you've ever, Get a chance. The best book I've read about nuclear power um, is *A Bright Future*, which uh, I forgot the name of the authors, but they um, perhaps you could look it up. But they they talk a lot about this. But basically, nuclear stays low always unless I specifically incentivize it um, on this toggle here, and that's really because it's just because we're assuming everything else is staying the same except for the carbon price as we're looking at En-ROADS right now. And if the if we were to do that, that also means we're assuming these really stringent, uh, you know, in some minds, oppressive uh, regulatory means to, to keep nuclear down, to keep it super uh, safe. Um, that doesn't mean that France and Sweden and other countries um, get most of their electricity from nuclear and will continue to. It just means that it's not getting more of the share because the, the countries that are skittish of it, like the United States, um, will remain skittish to it, according to this model. And um, the carbon price is so effective because it touches so many parts of the economy. Um, but if we put our carbon price in the model and then start moving other sliders, are we double counting impacts? How does that work? No. Oh, that's a, I'm so glad that question came up because I should have been clear about that too. There's a lot to talk about with this model. So here's what happens. Yes, it's um, we're not double counting things. But we can add, you know, it's not additive, but we can see what more than one policy happens at a time. I actually like to play this game and I encourage you to actually play, you know, uh, play with this model on your own and see if you can find some surprising things because I like to see how hard is it without carbon pricing of any kind to get us down to two degrees and even harder, 1.5 degrees. I, I think that that argument alone can get a lot of converts to, to the, the cause of carbon pricing as a, as a centerpiece of, an, of a robust and 
uh, versatile uh, climate policy. However, you're right. One thing I should say is if we were to grow, go now and say, we're, we're actually continuing to say that we just have, uh, we're by putting the carbon price on, we are going to be affecting all these other things. So we can actually see things, you know, other impacts and some of the impacts are, are fascinating. Like I can look at the financial impacts. That's, a, that's something that comes up. I know this is a little bit off of the point, but I, I will get to answer this question. It's just like, yes, the cost of energy will go up, but at some level it starts tapering, uh, leveling off and tapering down because we have hit this, this uh, critical, um, this uh, critical velocity where we now have so much coming onto the uh, environmental sectors that are, that is carbon neutral that it's no longer affecting us. This the gradually increasing carbon price. Carbon price is still going up and up and up, but because we've moved so far away from those carbon carbon rich energy sources, we're not seeing that anymore. Um, I could also look at other impacts. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Like, um, uh, oh, let's see. Let me actually do this over here because I like doing this. One one I really like looking at is. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, this is one of my favorites. Greenhouse gas emissions by area. So here we are, okay, so now we've looked at land use CO2, other CO2, uh, energy CO2 is the charcoal, that's the one we're most concerned with right now. F gases is, is a slight uh, contributor. Methane is by the end of this, is the second largest contributor. Um, and when I look at this, actually, let's go back, if I undo the policy, so here's without a carbon price. Or actually, this is because I did this. This was with the um, Baker Schultz because that was the one I did right before this. I should have zeroed that out, but I can go back twice and see. This is without uh, without the carbon price. The carbon continues to accelerate, uh, so it's like it grows and grows towards the, the the end of the century. With the carbon price, with our EICDA in, uh, not the Baker Schultz, but with the EICDA in, it now has a carbon. The carbon um, component is now no longer the primary driver at the at the tail end of the century is actually less than methane. So I can go back and then talk again about farming practices and natural gas line leaks and stuff and try to that which means basically regulations to try to bring the methane down. And because we can now talk about like, well, we will get a certain burn. So now we've with just these two policies, notice we're almost at two degrees right now. That's a change. It used to take like three degrees or sorry, three policies to get us there, um, which is good news. That's one of the updates that they've done. Uh, they had one of the, the biggest updates uh, that the Climate Interactive folks did was in December. That's to a point where it went, it used to be 4.1 to 2.8 was with the EICDA. Now it's 3.6 to 2.6, a full degree centigrade down. Um, and now at this point we can say, okay, so we still have a lot of greenhouse gas emissions there. So now we can start talking about carbon removal. And if we start, if we now impose some of those great ideas about soil sequestration or biochar or um, bioengineering algaes and lichens that can suck up more carbon than they naturally would, then we can actually like, let's just say we have some sort of moderate breakthrough of that. We've now, you can see that by the end of the century, we're almost carbon, Neutral. We're sucking up as much carbon in the from the atmosphere as we are uh, as we are emitting. Now, the model. I should. Al I always tell people before, like right before we talk about carbon pricing, I say this is a um, sobering model because it shows just how much work we have to do. But I think it's super empowering um, because it shows. Again, it's super. It's, I mean, I'm I'm fired up about it because it makes my job convincing folks that carbon pricing is like one of the first things we should, is, is the first thing we should do, um, especially as aggressive as we can make it, that um, it, it, it becomes an easier case to make with something like this. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, David. Uh, so we just have a couple of questions uh, relating to uh, the final result of the carbon price. So one, one pulling us in either direction. So the first question is, uh, do folks ever get freaked out when you when you put in an eight hundred dollar carbon price? And the <laughs> other is, um, how do you make the argument for the carbon price uh, when folks are saying that's not enough to get us down to two degrees Celsius? Mm, yeah. Okay. So both of those things have actually surprising. Maybe it's surprising that they haven't come up. One, I think, because people don't buy carbon; they buy gas and they buy number two heating oil or whatever they do. Um, 
And so carbon is like one step away from something that they actually purchase. And um, they may freak out when they see that it goes up to being that level. I always say um, that the stipulation of the EICA CDA is that we, it no longer increases once we get to what, 10% of 1990, which is the same as 2015 uh, CO2 levels. So it's not the beginnings of a universal basic income, which uh, could be scary for conservative folks, if that makes sense. Um, I think the other, uh, so I actually don't get people aghast at the $800. They probably should. The second point that you said is why would people, um, oh yeah, so does it, does it hurt the argument for a carbon price or the EICDA when it doesn't get us down to 2.1? I, I actually, I don't find that either. And I think it actually helps us if we are very upfront. And I think that I'm thinking a lot about the conversation I sat in on yesterday with progressives. Uh, sorry, like how to how to speak to progressives is that I think the a common complaint about how CCL uh, from progressive angle is that it's it's you know they're we're talking about it like it's the silver bullet or like that is the end all be all and that that this is all we need and when in fact this shows quite the quite that that's quite not the case um, and uh, Mark Reynolds was clear about that saying like. You know, what did he say? Silver bullets, the only thing that's a silver bullet is a silver bullet. So we need complementary things. And like I said, we're all, I'm looking forward to the day when Danny Richter can, you know, let's hope it's in a couple of years, tells us like, okay, now that we've got an EICDA in a, uh, passed into law and signed, um, what can we work on next? And let's work on methane, the second biggest contributor, or let's talk about some direct air capture or, or, or biochar and, and agricultural land uses. Because we need complementary things. Some of the complementary things we need to talk about include stuff from the progressive angle, from the environmental justice angle, because um, this that, this kind of talk can leave those people feeling kind of like leave them feeling cold, um, because it's not talking about humans as much as it's talking about prices and markets, which is something that doesn't speak to that crowd as much. Does that help? Great. I think we have an audience question. Who has his hand raised, Mike? Uh, yes, I, I'd like to make a point that um, that uh, carbon pricing gasoline is, is difficult in terms of actually reducing its consumption by people who have already bought a pig mobile. And the, you really have to head it off at the pass. You have to tax the pig mobile when they buy it. Because once they've bought it, that vehicle is going to consume a certain number of gallons of gasoline by the time it hits the uh, junk heap. They aren't going to junk it until it's no longer repairable, no matter how much the gas costs. And so, you know, you really have to tax the vehicle when it is bought. You have to incentivize buying electric vehicles and you have to de-incentivize buying pig mobiles. And, you know, taxing the gasoline won't cut down the gasoline. That's the point. Yeah, I that's, no, thank you. I think, I, I think that's a great perspective. I, I really, and I hear that there's a lot of, um, and a lot of it I think comes from, I may actually break away from Enroad just a second because I want to show a slide that I think I've been relying on more and more when I do these presentations, just because when I, I don't know about, about it sounds like Mike's, this, when I was hearing about Carbon Fee and Dividend or Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act for the first time and how, wrapping my head around how it worked, <coughs> excuse me, the thing I was thinking about was number two, heating oil and um, and gas for my car. And and he's right. There's a certain, there's, once you've bought a new a pig mobile, as, as he was calling it, or he was going to be, it's going to um, continue to em emit as long as that thing keeps on up and running. And it's those, the gradual increasing carbon cost is not going to disincentivize him to, to keep driving, um, especially when he has the means of a carbon dividend coming into his wallet to help him continue. I think the real savings we have to be really clear about when we're doing our sales pitch is that this works not only on the demand side for the consumer end of things, but also on the supply side for the companies that surround that fellow who's bought that, who's made that investment and bought a gas guzzler. If I were, um, so for instance, like as we know that uh, we're talking about things that are going to be evolving for the not just the next couple of years, we're talking about for the next decades. That's why it has to have, we're, we're so focused on um, bipartisan support. If we were to think about, um, well, let, actually let me move over if it's okay. I'm just gonna grab a slide and I'm jumping out of turn here a little bit. 
But let me just grab, where is it? Yes, okay. So for instance, this is, so the pri there's a distinction between primary um, energy sources, uh, our, our carbon footprint and secondary or embedded. Um, gasoline for our vehicles and utilities, electrical or heat, whatever it might be, are this blue and light blue at the bottom. For each income level, and the richer you are, the, the more this is true, the primary carbon uh, footprint is coming from secondary or embedded sources. So you can see how it's broken down here. It's in the shelters that we build for our, our um, healthcare, our food, the services we buy, um, transport, uh, you know, whatever the pr other products, um, the even uh, allocated PFI is like, is like um, investments. All of those things, you know, like you can think about it, like in order for me to buy a shirt, it has to have a certain carbon footprint from it becoming, you know, from the, the cotton that gets harvested to going into a plant, to becoming a shirt in a plant, to becoming, to getting shipped to, to the store, to where I bought it. All that stuff is um, made by companies that are much more sensitive to these slight price fluctuations than I am when I buy that gas guzzler. So for those, for, for companies to operate in a world where they know not only that the price of gas went up, whatever, we are, the $15 on a, on a ton of CO2, last I read was equivalent about like 12 cents on a gallon of gas, we thought. So, you know, that's a fluctuation we're used to. But to know that that's gonna be persistent and predictable forces those companies to move away from, um, from their carbon heavy lines of production even before the product gets to me. So I don't necessarily need to change my spending habit for the products that I buy and the services that it can provide to me to be to have less of a carbon footprint. So that's the big thing, the distinction between the embedded and secondary uh, carbon uh, uh, component, which is much bigger, especially if the wealthiest bracket than in the direct. Um, Peter, is this one of the most updated uh, household impact studies? I believe so. Oh, no, it's not. I guess it's, maybe it's not because it's too, thin, maybe I need to update this. This is a slide that I don't show all the time because that question doesn't come up all the time, but I have it in like, have it in my back pocket at the end of my slideshow just in case it does. Another one that shows that from the updated um, Hassum impact study is this one, which is easier. I just want to do it by, because that one actually showed by the, um, by the sector more specifically. This is just the direct costs down here in the dark blue and then the indirect costs up here in the light blue. And then the orange up there being like the financial assets um, at the, for, for the folks who are in the richest 20%. But yeah, th this is definitely from, from, the, from year one of the household impact study. And then we just had a couple of questions on um, compl complementary uh, policies in yes. En-ROADS. So can you implement a clean energy standard and are there other opportunities to implement other regulations besides some of the economic incentives like the subsidies, the taxes, and the carbon price? Yeah, um, there is, let's see, I think this does not come up very often, so forgive me if I'm not getting this right away. Um, clean energy standard might be something that we could talk about within, yes, okay, it'd be under, I think reduction in, in um, Percentage reduction in coal utilization and this spot. We can accelerate. Oh, okay, there's carbon capture and restorage. Yeah, I'm sorry. I guess I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head. My my belief is, and perhaps I can look it up right now, is just this in this I thing. If somebody else on the call knows. No, it's talking about equity and Yeah, I'm there sorry. There's an emissions that. performance standard at the bottom of the carbon oh. price. Oh, did I? I'm sorry, I missed it. Yes, you're right. Okay. But I'm not sure how that compares uh, technically to um, a clean energy standard. Yeah. In this implementation. Yeah, and I, I should do some homework on that. Does anybody else know? Is there, are there anything coming up in the chat? Or if you know, please speak up. 
We have a robust conversation on electric vehicles and, and incentives in the, in the chat. Um, okay. I think we have uh, uh, another question. Someone wanted to uh, look at uh, the population, uh, what effects uh, modifying the population growth would have. Sure, do they, I don't know if that person could say whether they want me to zero this out to see what population growth does all by itself. Let's do that actually. Let's go, uh, let's reset our assumptions and policies. I'm gonna assume this is okay. We can bring back the EICDA whenever we want to. So we can talk about population and just say, well, let's say, and this is the parameter that they're saying is that, and there's actually a lot of, this is another fascinating book is, um, there's a book called Empty Planet, which is basically saying that fertility rates are dropping much faster than the, uh, the standard models have been showing. So that, um, I think it was published in fall of 19, uh, 2019, um, it's a fascinating book and it talks about how that's going to create all kinds of problems for like the welfare states of Europe and other places, but even even places that have been worry spots for us, India and even uh, sub Saharan uh, Africa are losing are, are they're, they're stabilizing their population rates um, faster than um, or the, the infertility rates dropping faster and there's a population bomb they claim in in China. Anyways, we could we could move this way down and see we actually have very little growth. Oh, whoops, sorry. So there's the population in that subgraph there. We actually see that by the end of the century, it's kind of moving down. But because we're still anticipating more affluence growing around the world, which is a good thing, that means more energy consumption, which is a good thing, except for the fact that it means unless we get a handle on it and do some of these other policies, we're not going to be reducing much because the um, Population is only one driver in the consumption of, of, um, of, uh, or the, the emission of CO2. You can see here, like what I've done is I've changed that graph on the Kaya graph. So the global population is curved downwards. Um, but we can see that that only, when we multiply this all through uh, to get our, our units to, to work out, we've only got carbon emissions coming down a, a slight bit there. Other questions, sorry. Yeah, I think I think we're we're set for now. Okay, good. So I think what I so I you know the two things to take away after all the fog is settled, and I want to leave some time, but let me briefly go through just how I like to make my pitch. I mean, this is all familiar material for for everybody about the carbon fee and dividend, but what I use this model for is basically a third party analysis to show how effective carbon fee and dividend is. There is no silver bullet, but nothing does as much. So from there, I would move over to my to my slides and then we can have kind of a talk about this. But so I kind of bring this up, which is old news now. Um, and this is part of the section that I don't often talk about, but this is um, in the last legislative session. These are all of the different carbon uh, bills. This is from the Friends analysis, the, uh, the, the, the Quakers analysis. Um, we've got these seven bills that um, <clears throat> we're addressing carbon pricing, um, including our lead sponsors, um, whether it's bipartisan or not, how the price works and the course corrections if, it, if we don't get to the right spot. And our favorite, the EICDA is right here. Um, and we can see these models showing, you know, the, uh, the EICDA is referred to as the Deutsch bill in this, which is um, showing us the increase in uh, this is the large. This is the most aggressive, the second most aggressive increase of carbon price, second only to uh, the Coons bill, which is which was um, intentionally partisan to show. Basically, I think Senator Coons wanted to show if Republicans you don't come on board, this is how aggressive we're going to be on our own. I um, mean, so we're we're seeing the largest increase in price, which means on this graph the second steepest reduction of, to the Deutsch bill. Um, in uh, CO2 uh, emissions. And then I jump into our usual slides talking about how it's the, you know, let's focus on that bill. And we talk about how it's good for people, good for the economy, um, effective and revenue neutral. Um, I would add it's expedient. Um, and then I talk about this and we're, I'm not actually gonna belabor all this stuff with you because we all know this, but one of the things I think is critical and I think to uh, what, what Michael, I believe and a few other folks were, concerned with was just 
uh, pushing back on the, the, the question about why, uh, and maybe if you can reimagine, um, it's, it's almost like having a birth memory now, but if could you could reimagine the first time you heard about the EICDA and you're like, huh, how does that work again? The first, the stumbling block for me, and I don't know if this was true for everybody else was, how is this fair that I get the same check that the CEO of Chevron Oil gets, you know? Um, and of course, it's like, we're grabbing these kinds of slides, which are openly available from uh, the US Treasury Department's where I grabbed this one, which is just showing that after tax income, you know, the folks on the bottom 10% do best and everyone seems to break even till about 60, 70 percentile because those folks at the top end are the ones that have the most lavish lifestyle. You know, if that CEO of Chevron owned a house in Maine, he'd have a private jet flying him there and he'd have a outdoor um, heated swimming pool in a 20 degree day or whatever it might be. So, and because I live in Maine, I, I hit up this to show like the rural more, uh, the, the, the parts of the state that have more poverty are the ones that are projected to do better. Even with those long um, those long commutes in those gas guzzlers, because gasoline overall is actually surprisingly not a huge component of the overall carbon dividend that these people are gonna be paying in. This we've already looked at, which is similar to what I said before. Um, I like to point to Canada because it's a Northern neighbor of Maine's and just talk about the experience of British Columbia. And this is just taken directly from the CCL website, um, but with these graphs. Um, and then talking about, then I talk a bit about the uh, border adjustment fee and how the, uh, the, that does, that actually opens up, especially amongst conservative crowds. I feel like this is the, some of the most persuasive parts of it. Um, regionally, I think we can all think of different parts of our states where we've had things that got hit really hard in, uh, economically. Uh, with recent tariff battles. So when you bring up tariffs, it's kind of a poison word, especially amongst chambers of commerce folks and um, business-minded, uh, market-oriented, conservative folks, whatever it might be. Um, but the uh, carbon, the you know, the, of the countries that price carbon, we're looking at all of the countries that either price carbon domestically or participate in some sort of regional carbon price or on the brink of doing so. And you know you can see that the folks that a lot of conservatives point to, yes, China does not have nearly the carbon price it needs for us to um, to be on to be in the right direction. But it has something, which is something that the United States and Russia and Somalia and you know so Saudi Arabia do not. So um, we could talk about the border adjustment fee and about how I like to use it as an opportunity to reach out to folks to say this is business friendly and it helps both protect. U.S. industry because they don't have to compete with foreign competition that isn't pricing their carbon, but it also exports the market. When let's pick a country, when Algeria is ex exporting steel to the United States, and we have we're now this green country, we're now col the color green because we have a carbon price. We are going to slap a fee on them, or if, even China. Like if th that's not the same level, we'll slap the difference on the on theirs on their imports. So they would want to participate in a common market with us. And on top of that, mostly because they wanna keep those dollars that are going to the American um, Fed to, in, domestically in China. So they'll, they'll want to, to, to up their carbon price to, to compete on a level playing field. The big thing, of course, that, we all, that, that a lot of us know about is um, the announcement by the EU, which is uh, Danny brought up uh, yesterday, which was saying that, <coughs> excuse me, saying that they are imposing uh, equivalent carbon border adjustment fee on any imports into the EU common market, which is a big player, which means that, you know, Maine, we, you know, what, what else do we talk about in our exports besides lobster? So Maine already took it on the chin with, with, um, with Nova Scotian lobster, lobster from Canada, that they didn't have to play any kind of funny tariff games with the EU in the past administration. Could you imagine, I mean, that was, that really hurt main industry. Could you imagine a future where we're actually talking about Canada and the EU now being in a common marketplace, they're part of the Commonwealth, and the United States not? Like, that's really going to hurt uh, lobstering in Maine. And, you know, that's, I, I'm hoping that that's the, the best way to get to the heart of our senators and representatives. Um, I'm just going to go through quickly because you know these things already. The Luntz poll is always great to show Republican support. Um, 
and then I talk about I you know the the statement by the economists uh, talking you know I including Janet Yen all the Fed chairmen we've talked Danny also I'm I'm reiterating Danny's talking points before these are pictures of our meetings just to show what CCL does this is my daughter thanking Representative Pingree when she became the first supporter and this is us meeting with um, Angus King and us meeting with um, what's the name of our other senator oh yeah Susan Collins and um, then I'll move down here. That's a joke. I know her name. And then um, this one, as I also include, and I don't always show this, um, but I think this is important. This is um, borrowed from Catherine Hayhoe's last book uh, about the uh, incidences of, of climate change related deaths averaging at 150,000 per year. Um, and where it's happening is exact opposite of where, you know, the, the, the the countries most culpable for the for most guilty for for the the cause of this, the prime drivers, of course, the United States, Europe, Russia, China, um, Australia to a lesser degree, and and here it is, sub-Saharan Africa is the one taking on the chin. In fact, this gentleman sitting here next to my daughter is a um, a CCL member from Portland. He's a new Mainer. He's a a, um, a refugee from. Uh, he's a climatologist from the University of Bujumbura. And he's at that meeting. He spoke to this very well because of um, uh, Burundi is right there in that red spot. So, um, so that's where I'll leave it off. And we should have. I meant to. I should have left more time for for question. But I'd love to hear. My voice is going already. But I'd love to hear more discussion about how you find En-ROADS helping you out in your um, presentations, where you use it. I should say that I I find it. I use it differently, obviously, for progressive crowds and for conservative crowds um, and moderate crowds. I think that um, that's kind of fits right in line with what we do. I know that um, it is not any kind of official relationship between En-ROADS and CCL. And I know that uh, the En-ROADS findings, when it went through its robust peer review, it actually whittled down a bit what we thought they should have, or according to, to um, folks at CCL National, the projections for what the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act should be greater, if you were to actually go by the IPCC, they built in some conservativeness into the model, so it doesn't actually show it to be as great as, it, as we could be. But, um, but even with that, I find it's super important to talk about, and it's a good tool to have in order to show its comparative effectiveness. And then the the equitability issues, you follow up with these slides showing that it, it mostly benefit the the dividend mostly affects uh, helps the poor in um, in working class. Peter, folks are really interested in if you would share your slides with them. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I would. I'd be happy to. I can. Um, per, how to? How would be the best way to work that um, if I share it with? You, Iona, and or Rob or somebody, and um, or put it on a, a a drive, a Google Drive. I'm not hearing anything, so I'll assume that's true. I think we have a, a question from uh, from the audience from Paul. Oh, Paul, we're going to talk about jazz. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I, I heard your band online. Really good. Oh, thanks. Um, Great. Okay. Yeah. First of all, David and Peter, five stars for this presentation. This is really, really helpful. So our member of Congress, who's actually a co-sponsor, thank goodness, um, told us that he had heard about En-ROADS at a meeting of the Progressive Caucus. Okay. Apparently they had Climate Central come in and give them a presentation. So he was really enthousi enthusiastic about it. He hasn't been as enthusiastic since about us bringing more information to them. But what I wanted to ask you is, do we know about any presentations that En-ROADS is making directly to members of Congress other than that? I've asked, yeah, that's a great question, Paul. I've asked Danny about that. Um, and I remember that there's a little bit of distancing that has been trying, I mean, this is not, I'm not saying that everybody should use En-ROADS and I think it depends on, especially if you're a liaison, what your relationship with is with that liaison. I think that it's smart to keep a little distance. Um, because it, I think En-ROADS is also, like I said, there's a little bit of a disappointment amongst you know, the CCL, the folks who know really more of the science than I do about 
how it doesn't show exact, you know, what we were hearing the purported, the, the IPCC was saying would be the effects of a carbon price of this aggressive nature. Um, I, so I'm a liaison to a Senator who's part of the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. I have brought this, I brought this to him a year ago because I was fired up about it. And because he was dithering about, you know, how should I know which is the right climate method? And I was like, well, how about this? This is a good tool. Um, and because he um, shares kind of a, a nerdiness with me, I think it worked. Like we both enjoyed climbing Nerd Mountain together up this, you know, with a, uh, looking at this model. And um, and uh, and he loves graphs and charts. So if you have that kind of a, a senator, and of course not every senator is like that, then I think it's great. I I asked um, the CCL National, maybe Iona, you know something that I don't, but I don't know if, I don't think En-ROADS has made any kind of presentation to the Senate Climate Solutions Caucus or the House Science Climate Solutions Caucus. Last I know, they did not. There's been no formal presentation. So if you are a liaison or if you know a liaison or if you want to, um, I, I think it's important. I think especially in those groups, to bring it to those folks. I think it's particularly to the progressive folks too, because um, uh, pro, uh, how do we say this? Progressives are not as uh, have not been as fired up as maybe we'd like them to be about climate about carbon pricing, and this this maybe do do the trick, especially when you talk about it not as you know as a, as a central component, but not as the be all end all, because they really want to hear things about EJ and about um, taking care of uh, of the most vulnerable and that kind of stuff. Does that answer your question, David? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's, I just wondered, like I said, if, you know, if Enros was approaching directly, and it sounds like maybe not in general. I don't think so. I know that um, that's a good question, and I could send that up the chain. But I don't. I know that last I had checked, they had not. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a good tool. I mean, it's for me. I I, I wouldn't. They're going to be um, agnostic about which plan to work. So they're just going to say, okay, here's the plan, or here's the model you tell me what you want to see. And, and if you've got a Republican, they're going to say, let's plant a trillion trees. Oh, that's not going to work. Well, that's too bad. That's the only thing we're looking at. Or, you know, or whatever it might be. Or like a progressive will say, let's just highly renewable, highly sub, um, incentivize renewables. Uh, you know, that doesn't do as much as I'd like either. So, I, you know, I think it's, there's, if you were to, I think it's, imp I think it, it's a good tool for CCL folks to bring to their uh, sitting members of Congress because we can do it and also have in the back of my mind that carbon pricing is the is not the silver bullet, but a big winner. Hey, thanks. Plus it gives you a, an excuse to get in touch with them again, right? It's just something to, to bring to them. Absolutely. I'm finally unmuted. And uh, the answer is, I don't know if, if they've, um, uh, presented to the Climate Solutions Caucus, but I don't believe that, uh, I mean, I'm sure it's been offered, yeah. but I don't know. I mean, I don't think they've been that active um, lately. Yeah, they, they seem very much to be a grassroots group primarily, which is, um, yeah. How many people have had, have used En-ROADS in uh, either a endorsement meeting or a, um, a liaison, um, a lobbying meeting. Cool. Do you, anybody else have any tricks of the trades um, besides hearing my squeaky voice? I found it to be really helpful in, um, so I, I'm a liaison for uh, Senator Markey and um, his office is very sophisticated on climate change and, um, haven't found this and they they were familiar with the tool already so it didn't lead to anything new in that relationship um, but other offices who are less familiar uh, with the landscape of climate policy climate solutions uh, I think benefit really well from uh, from this kind of approach especially offices that describe themselves as very data driven yeah I think it was very useful for the staffer we met with and we met with many times before to actually make choices and play with it and not just have us talk and say what he thought were the most important thing things 
none of them were carbon price. And I got into play with that and say, oh, that makes a much bigger difference. And that just yeah. turned things around for him. Yeah, Gene, that's a great point. So I, I don't know if I got went over that too fast, but I always try to make sure that they are driving the conversation. And yeah. it's yeah. only happened to me one where someone said, I don't care what else you say, just right away, I want to see carbon pricing. And that person, I don't, you know, they're not a CCL person at that time, but they were after that meeting. Um, so I, um, but I think it's super important because it invests them into seeing the outcome. And, you know, I think the one caveat to that is that I'm, I get worried that it burst people's bubbles so much that they get disappointed that like, oh, I really wanted this to do so much better. Um, that's the only thing I'd be worried, just saying like, just make sure that you're always saying all of these things are important. These, you know, we are up, you know, what's Creek. We have to be able to, to move on all fronts at all times and every step in the right direction is important. But with the carbon pricing, what might have had a modest um, result actually has a greater result. Does that make sense? Yeah, he was other other things like uh, tax on coal have a big effect, and so it, it reorients his thinking about what policies make the most sense from the point of view of his congressional office. Great, I have a congressman. Go ahead. Um, okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, we used it as sort of a post endorsement uh, tool. Oh. Uh, we got a um, endorsement from the uh, Architects Institute of America chapter and they had an ongoing educational program that they do. Um, and so we actually uh, did that for one of their programs and they got it qualified to get sort of ongoing educational credits. Um, and I'm looking to use it similarly to to just connect with other groups. Uh, so not necessarily, they may not be able to endorse the bill, but sort of maybe recruit more members or just get them more engaged and sort of get the word. And it sort of has a way to build relationships with uh, other groups to sort of start things out. I used it with um, my uh, congressional my congressman's uh, aid, tax aid. And basically he, uh, the congressman had already introduced another bill that um, subsidizes emerging technologies. And so I estimated what that would be like on En-ROADS and showed it to the tax aid and then added on the, carbon, the EICDA and it just boosted both both of the new tech and the um, and the renewables. So it was it was, you know he was wow you know he was very impressed. And, uh, yeah, I think I, he showed it. That's great, Nancy. Those are those are. I I often think about that. You know, just as we were hearing about climate change being a threat multiplier from Catherine Hale yesterday, <laughs> we could think about the EICDA being a virtue multiplier. It's kind of the opposite direction. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Um, so um, my wife and I listened to the En-ROADS um, um, 7 a.m. presentation of their newest, some of their newest uh, updates in the model on either Thursday or Friday. Um, they did a very clever thing, um, I, I thought, which, which was uh, he, he showed, he showed the start off and showed what the General Motors presentation is of making all their vehicles electric and so on, with, as you would all guess, has a limited helpful effect, um, unless there's important uh, change in how you do the electrification. But then he took and said, wait, well, China has come up with a, um, with, with a, um, I guess, avocational set of goals for 2060 to be completely carbon neutral by, by 2060. And they had a very specific plan what, what, of how they were going to get there, which was the powerful thing of it. And he put that into the En-ROADS model and by golly, they get there. Um, and um, 
and then and and then he kind of related that to what they know of so far of of the uh, of the Biden plan and so on, and how that kind of would may, how would that fit onto there. So it and and um, um, that shows we have work to do. <laughs> um, but but anyhow, it it was I, I thought it was very effective at addressing this this objection about well the United States is only producing fifteen percent of the carbon emissions in the world, and how are we going to ever do that if 80, how are we ever going to get there if 85 percent of the world is is not with us? Well, China's a big one, and and uh, and they're producing goods to go around the world, you know. So I, I thought it was a very effective way to present things. Thank you, Randy. I'm so glad you said that because um, th those are great to see. I'm I'm imagining that that's still up on their or that's uh, something you can consume from their website if we were to to go and check that out. I, I don't know that for sure, but they're, they're very open about sharing things. Yeah. yeah. When we, that 15% um, argument that United, why should United, you know, why should the United States work so hard at this when we only have 15%? Again, I mean, that's the thing where I talk about, yeah, but we're a huge economic driver. And if we, and so much of the world is lagging behind waiting for us to do something, once we do put something this aggressive in place, um, they will, they, they don't want to turn their backs on our, our dollars. So while we're still a big economic driver, we should put our our um, we should in, in implement this carbon price with a with a with a border adjustment fee. Yeah, mm -hmm. to incentivize it towards the world. Mm -hmm. David, thank you. Are there anything else on the chat? I haven't been looking here. Lots of uh, compliments, Peter. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you so much for everybody. Um, you know, in that in, in that same webinar, uh, they had a question about nuclear, and it, they used the uh, marginal cost of energy to show uh, why nuclear it doesn't become a major factor going forward. Um, Interesting. You you guys are one uh, webinar ahead of me. I got to watch that one. Okay. <laughs> David, is there a way? I know we're we're over time now, but is it, how does the chat get saved? Is I'd love to see it. I didn't have time as I was blabbing on to to look at things, and I'd like to see some of these resources people are putting in place. Uh, I believe our host uh, can can click the little, the three little ellipses down there in the chat and save that. Um, but I think it's also might be saved with whatever account is doing the recording. Okay, thank you, anybody okay. in the chat. Anybody just can go, save the chat. Yes, just at the bottom of the chat. So everybody can save it for the gotcha. if they want. Great. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for your attention. And, you know, as I said to our main state group, um, I have, uh, you know, I, I like doing this. I like bringing En-ROADS to, to different groups. I actually um, have more uh, excitement to bring it than I have a, a wealth of uh, index cards on my Rolodex at this point. So um, I'm, if you need somebody to be a willing person, feel free to, to, to email or call me up I'm, or email and we can, uh, if, it, if it works in the schedule, I'd love to, to, to help along and, and, and move toggles on the En-ROADS for you. All right, thank you guys. It's 2.38, I don't know, am I the one who's supposed to end? Okay, thank you guys.